Right, hi everyone. My name is Sumer Luna and I'm an international student tutor here at DMU. Hi guys, my name is Isaac Bryning and I'm a third year law student here as well. And we're here to talk to you today about academic literacy and student inclu inclusivity and um, the potential challenges faced by the, B, uh, by the BAME EAL, which is English as an Additional Language Student Community. So looking at the term BAME um, as an umbrella term, what are the implications? Um, we all know it's a very broad term. We've got lots of different populations all lumped together. And each population group, each minority group, does face various different challenges. So some ethnic minority groups might have more of a problem with unemployment, um, Islamophobia, family pressure. And the only thing really, um, the only thing in common with, uh, between the ethnic groups is they don't have white skin. And between these um, ethnic groups, some students are actually, uh, some ethnic minority groups are outperforming other student groups as well. So, for example, Indian and Chinese students might be doing a lot more better than other ethnic minority groups. And within these differences, there's further differences. So, we've got things like um, whether a BAME, uh, a BAME student is um, an English native speaker or whether they've got English as an additional language. Um, and there are lots of definitions that people have come up with. Researchers have decided that there could be alternative definitions to the term BAME, such as people of colour, minoritised ethnic people, visible minorities. But I do think that BAME really needs to be looked at, especially in a higher education context, such as um, this institution. The ma majority of students are BAME students, so why are we called, why are we part of the minority, basically? Do you think, sure. Isaac? Um, from my perspective, it's always been somewhat of a sensitive topic because I felt not a lot of people had the bravery or courage that some of the other people that have developed relationships along the way in specifically targeting BAME and how it has a lack of inclusivity, even though on first glance it would seem to be the most well-known term to represent a community of individuals. And that's one thing we miss when we use the term BAME, is those individuals and the nuances within each community. Okay, thank you. So looking at the implications, um, higher education access, retention, succession, progression rates, they do vary between the different ethnic groups. BAME students, um, they're treated as, homo as a homogenous group, but what actually happens is when higher education, they decide to put forward um, interventions or resources, it's misdirected and it's not supporting the students who really need it because you're treating everyone as one. Um, what we suggest is, and a lot of research is suggesting that HE providers should consider disaggregated racial or ethnic inequalities, looking at the data between the different ethnic groups to support the attainment gap and understand the student experience. So if you've got black students, subgroups, what type, where, where are these students from? If you've got Asian students, you can't c categorize them all as one because there's a big difference between Indian students and Pakistani students, Bangladeshi students. Um, and these outcomes and progression uh, the progression rates and the attainment, it's because we're using the term BAME, it's hidden because it's all treated as one. And these differences have lifelong repercussions. So I want to emphasize that although this is about the attainment gap, actually these students will continue getting disadvantages even after they graduate, even after they finish their university studies. We've seen that it's not so much of an issue with um, access to higher education for BAME students. In fact, BAME students do have higher, there's higher access rates for BAME students than white students in some cases, but it's the retention. Why are there, um, why, is there why is the retention rate lower for all ethnic groups mainly? Well, uh, considering, I, I, actually I think it affects everyone apart from Indian and Chinese students. Um, so, as I was saying about the lifelong repercussions, what I want to really emphasize is it's not just the difference in attainment. You've got employment outcomes between white and BAME graduates, which persist even after three years of graduation. Looking at the data, you can see that between the subgroups, there's a big difference. We can see Pakistanis, Bangladeshi community, the African student community, the employment outcomes really affect them more than other student groups. 
So moving on to um, BAIN EAL speakers, so these are students with English as an additional language. UK higher education institutes do have a very high population of BAME students who have English as a second or even third language. I really want to make clear that this is not to do with English competency. This is not looking at a deficit model. This is just highlighting further institutional barriers that maybe the student or staff may not even be aware of. Um, we need to resist the tendency to view students as the problem and we need to accept institutional responsibility. So HE providers really, it's not about targeting students and thinking they're deficit in their linguistic capabilities. That's not what we're trying to say here. Uh, we just want to highlight an example. So a student who may originally be from Somalia, moved to the Le Netherlands, settled in the UK. This student is classed as a home student. But if you look at their language, they've got three different languages. And it's amazing. This is not, this is, it's definitely not a deficit model. Um, this student has managed to pick a Somalian as their first language. They've got Dutch possibly as a second language. And then they've learned English as their third language. And I think this, this goes with you as well, Isaac, yes. your personal experiences. So I was originally born in Ghana, West Africa. And my mother raised me um, to learn her language first, which was Fanti and then the common language within the country, which is tree. And then coming over to London, having to develop my English, because it was quite basic when I arrived. Um, one of the issues I found was that I was usually the student who was uh, doing a lot more work outside of school, just so I could keep up in some, some respects. But that didn't last long, because I grasped the language, and you know I managed to get better grades in the end of it all. But that was just on a personal basis. I, I went out of my way to make sure that I was as good as, if not better, than some of the, um, the native speakers um, in my classrooms. So again, this, what we want to highlight is these home students who have AA, EAL, um, they might not have gone through the full UK educational processes. Some of them might have come th during the end of primary school or secondary school. And it's, a lot of it is to do with the preparedness for higher education success. What I mean by this is there are other factors that we need to consider. Things like family, um, parental lack of experience, um, the fact that most of these students, just like I was, was amongst the first in their families to go to university. So they've had the less exposure to academic English. So as an English language lecturer, I often, I teach on an MA uh, module where I'm, uh, I do have a lot of BAME students and when we give feedback and if, when they come and talk to me about feedback that they've received on their assessments, um, a lot of it they say to me, you know, our tutors say that you write like you talk um, and, and they get really confused. They say, am I not supposed to? Nobody told me. And I found this is a repeated pattern. Um, there's a big difference. As I said, this is not to do with linguistic um, capabilities, but there is a big difference between academic English, so things like cohesion, vocabulary, sentence structure, formal writing, as opposed to spoken English, which is just everyday English. Academic writing is acknowledged as a challenge, not just for BAME students, but for all students. But this is an area that we need to really look at because we can see from evidence that BAME students are more likely to use informal language. So the story began in my second year of studying, and I handed in a piece of coursework nearing the end of the academic year. And the only piece of uh, just feedback that I received on that coursework was poor academic writing. And that left me a shock because at the time I wasn't quite aware of what that meant, the implications behind it. So like most people, I went straight to Google and I tried to figure out what this means. And I'm sure you can imagine the whole host of uh, <laughs> uh, circumstances that I was allegedly going to face because of this uh, feedback. And because I was connected with some lecturers, one of them happens to be here now, we had a conversation about you know, what this uh, feedback really meant. And you know, after going through my essay, she happened to give me the, the advice not to worry and not to be as stressed as I, as I was at that time. And you have to think about those students who aren't as well connected, who don't necessarily have access to ask another lecturer who is what qualified enough to go through the work and give that feedback. And you know, you can, you can only imagine how distressed that they'll be in um, when they see such information. And also just being left there, you know, as, as an individual, you're almost floating like, what do, where is the next place for me academic wise? You know, am I going to even make it to next year at this point? So as a, as a lecturer, I would, I would 
you know, advise that, you know, in your feedback to be as detailed as possible and, you know, open that conversation out to students, possibly even beforehand. Good. So what we can see is language and study skills do play a significant role in student attainment. Um, even looking at Isaac's um, personal experiences, what we're saying is not only does this affect attainment, but it could, it could have an impact on personal well-being. Um, BAME students, from research shown, it is they are less likely to ask for help from academics. They don't feel as well supported in their studies in comparison with white students. So this is something we need to, as lecturers, do more in terms of outreach and reaching out to students. Don't wait for them to approach us. Um, so just as schools heavily invest into research between EAL students, language abilities and outcomes, universities really need to take responsibility for students' academic skills development. Um, when we do put to, when, when HEIs take responsibility, they need to be very careful of putting forward a deficit model. All targeting should be universal and accessible, all, so, all support <coughs> systems, infrastructure, it should be made available to everyone, not just a specific community, even though that is who you might be targeting. Um, again, with targeting, I find that a lot of higher education institution, institutions might be uncomfortable with the whole process of targeting because they are afraid of um, creating problems or causing offence. But why is it okay to do it with other student groups? Why are they targeting international students, for example? Why are they targeting students with specific learning difficulties? Why isn't that same approach taken to BAME students? Um, so, want to move on to inclusivity and contextualized <coughs> academic support. As I said, I'm an international student tutor and I provide support for international students. However, I think that this just should not be only for international students. From research shown, it can be seen that BAME EAL speakers have a shared relationship and a shared <coughs> learning environment with international students and with other student groups such as students with learning difficulties. My role is to give students friendly advice before submission and students come to see me and they might not even be aware of any issues that they, might, uh, that they may, may have. It's an open door service, they can just come in and get some friendly advice and sometimes it's lecturers who will just say to students, oh have you seen Sumeya, why don't you go and have a look at, go through your assignment with her and what I found is that the learning development tutors, our roles, we are more approachable, BAME students will come and see us more easily than they access support with their module tutors because it's easier for them to discuss their support without that feeling of shame or without feeling inadequate, without feeling like they don't know what they're doing. Um, what we found is generic support is not enough. So although higher education institutions may be putting on generic support classes, central support services, it's not always enough, it's not targeted. And there, there's the issue of how many students actually do access these services regularly. They might go for a one-off session, but are they going regularly? Um, what's your experience, Isaac? Sure. Um, I can hardly recall <laughs> that's how bad it was. Um, it was somewhat limited, the, the um, advice that I received from the university themselves with regards to um, academic writing. Um, it didn't feel bespoke to my course, it just felt very generic. Um, anything that you know, an IT student or a law student would sit in, it just didn't seem as helpful. Okay. Would you access this support then? Sure. Um, so in terms of contextualized academic support, on the other hand, um, you know, comparing the two, you have uh, a much more approachable system here where I as a student can just drop in and have a conversation with Samaya or another of her colleagues, um, also easily accessible. You know, this isn't a compulsory thing whenever I'm you know, preparing for a piece of coursework or just trying to brush up on certain information, I can just drop by and have this conversation also, Excellent. which just proves you know, how effective it can be because as a student, you'll also be monitoring your own feedback or the, the, the grades that you're receiving from your work. And if you're seeing traction, clearly there is a, a, an upside to having this um, contextualized academic support. Thanks. Um, so, recommendations. Um, what I suggest is actually there's now more than a million pupils between the ages of five to eight years old um, in schools in England. They speak over 360 languages between them. 
Um, don't wait for students to start university. I mentioned before about being prepared for higher education. We can help that. As a higher education institution, it's our responsibility. We can target students by working in partnership with local and regional schools and colleges. Um, around 17% of the school population in England and Wales now has English as an additional language. So introduce students to what's expected of them at university study. This will hopefully increase their confidence and self-belief and better prepare them for higher education success. When it comes to delivering sessions, I'm not just talking about really boring academic skill sessions. Um, no, keep it fun. You know, they could be all sorts of sessions. You've got mentoring sessions, team building exercises, because these students will have to get used to working with many, many diverse cultures. And use BAME role models to deliver these sessions. So it's not enough to just say you're doing something, but it, you've got to do it effectively. BAME students um, it, the, uh, will appreciate having BAME role models where where you're speaking in an accessible language, although we all speak English, but sometimes what happens is you're getting people in to deliver these sessions, and the language is just so complicated, it puts students off from accessing these support services. And the recommendations don't just stop there. They, um, for tutors as well, they should give helpful feedback on academic skills during their study. I know it's their role to mark on content, but if you're seeing a student who has clear problems with academic literacy, make a note of it. Don't just mark the student down. Um, don't and give the student the support before the first assessment is due. We heard from Isaac's experience, he didn't even know that there was a problem with his writing or bad academic practice until he got his feedback. But why did he have to wait till he got his feedback? Why could these sessions not be embedded before the, before the course assessment was due <coughs> so students are fully aware of the requirements of what the, um, what the, what the tutor is expecting from them? Um, we need to stop thinking of language as a problem or a deficiency that affects students' performance. It's a resource. We can develop it as part of students' um, academic attainment. Consider the use of language in tutor feedback. Make sure your writing is clear, concise. It's easy to understand for everyone. Um, and again, if you want to show, if you expect your students to write in a certain way, Give examples, show good example writing practice models to be um, embedded in your module handbooks. These are the sort of things which will help students and give them a clear understanding of the type of formal writing that they should be adhering to. Um, and I just want to mention um, a successful intervention done by Sheffield Hallam University. I was really intrigued by this. They basically put together um, writing it yourself, writing retreats. This service was mainly, well, this support service was mainly targeted at Asian women and EAL speakers. However, it was accessible and open to everybody. They realized the, important of stu the importance of student, student voice. And they realized that for, the, you know, to rec recognizing student identities, this is all writing and language is linked to student voice. They put together writing retreats, so basically you'd get support with your dissertations, um, you'd get support with student writing um, by looking at good, good practice models, you'd have student feedback there um, and staff feedback. Um, and they, what the, the students were accessing the support looked at these examples of writing practice and realized that this is what I need to write like or along these lines to get high marks. And this intervention basically came about because those stud these students needed to develop their independent judgment and their use of study skills. They didn't want to put a de deficit model through by just getting students to access generic support. So this was done within faculties and actually the feedback was students actually credited this intervention with an improvement in their grades. So it went really, it was, it was actually really successful. And over time, what happened was students would invite other students to come along to these sessions and they started holding their own writing retreats. It worked because staff were persistent. They addressed real needs that sometimes a student might not get from other networks such as family. Um, so it was a good, and it was, it was non-judgmental. The students didn't really know the lectures pers personally, but they were there to get good advice, not just from other lecturers, but from other students as well. And they were sharing their writing amongst themselves. So what I really want to um, say is, looking at, um, looking at basically after everything we've spoken about, 
it's really important that we don't blame student deficiencies or look at this as a deficient model. Um, it's about institutional support and how we can make, uh, how we can create better support mechanisms for students. And if we are, to, if we are putting things in place, don't single students out. So ethnic minorities don't feel that we're just targeting them. Put systems in place where it's accessible to everyone, even though you might have a particular ethnic minority group in mind. So support should be integrated and multifaceted. And that's the end of our presentation. Thank you.